Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is a Sunday. Each Sunday, we do character studies. And we're, we've reached the point in, in Genesis uh, where we're talking about uh, this, one of the sons of Jacob, known as his name is Joseph, and we're studying his life. This is part three on the study of Joseph. So if you haven't seen the previous episodes, uh, they're uploaded on my YouTube channel. You, you should go back and watch those. But uh, I think today we should be able to conclude with the study of Joseph. I'm anticipating doing uh, chapters, uh, Genesis chapter 44 and 45 today. And with me today, I have Brother Eric. Uh, so before we get started in the study, Brother Eric, introduce yourself and say hi. Hello. It's me again, DeHalmo, also known as Brother Eric, and uh, also known as the Lone Ranger. And also known as, uh, did I say DeHolmo? Okay, back to you. Okay, let's let's uh, make sure that when they you say your name of your channel, they understand it because uh, I don't think they'll understand that how to get to it without it you spelling it. So it's it's D E H A L L M O. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Brother Luke, that's uh, absolutely correct. And uh, it's just D-E-H-A-L-L-M-O. Uh, and that pretty much covers everything. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank, thank you for joining me, Brother Eric. And uh, I hope everybody will subscribe to his channel. All right. Let's begin right now with the study. Uh, we're going to Genesis Chapter 42, um, I'm a, what Brother Joe Byron coined as a KJV firstist. Um, I like to look at the KJV first, but I, I, I'm not, I don't limit myself to that. If necessary, I'll look at some other translations. Sometimes we might look at the Amplified, uh, if it'll help us to understand. So we'll go with Genesis chapter 44, verse 1 in the KJV. He says, and he commanded the steward of his house, saying, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put every man's money in his sack's mouth and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. And. Now, first of all, Brother Eric, what is your response to this? Because it, it seems like uh, um, Joseph here is, is kind of messing with his brothers here. Uh, what, what do you think is his motivation for doing this? Because they go into a panic. As we know, the last time they, they went into a panic because the money they paid for the products that they purchased from Joseph, the corn, the grain, uh, the, the money that they paid was returned and uh, put in their sacks and they thought that they might be uh, accused of stealing it not paying for it and now he's not only returning uh put it giving them the food and their money but also putting in his silver cup what do you think he's thinking what is he trying to accomplish with that uh yes brother luke uh Something's going on there, isn't it? Uh, I think he has plenty of time, had plenty of time to uh, think this through, and uh, therefore he has implemented a very uh, well. We know it, uh, his character; he's very uh, wise. He's very business uh, oriented minded. He's good with numbers as well. And uh, all this combined, I think, uh, 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 makes him a very uh, talented and useful uh, person 
as we as we can see in the story. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, is he if he's trying to create some kind of like uh you know fear in his brothers about uh uh and panic in them or is, is it some sort form of a payback for for what he went through when he, he was put in the well and he sold into slavery and he didn't know what was going to happen to him and is he trying to make them under feel, feel this kind of feelings he had of, of being wrong falsely accused and then you know he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and uh, and he was unjustly thrown into the well and then and then sold into slavery. Does he maybe you think he wants them to understand how it feels to be mistreated and you're you're innocent and yet you're you're, you're suffering and it as a, but you're an innocent man. No, not at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. All I'm right. kidding. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, you know, he did. Uh, yes. Um, very, very good, Brother Luke. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next portion of verses here. It says, uh, uh, as soon as the morning light, morning was light, the men were sent away. Uh, they and their asses, that's talking about donkeys, not their rear ends. <laughs> and when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, uh, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for, for good? Is, is not this it? in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed that he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. So again, we can see here where he's uh, attempting to uh, uh, make them feel like they're falsely accused. They're, they're innocent. They didn't steal his cup. And, and yet uh, they're, they're, they're being charged with this. Anything to say about that, brother? Uh, yes, brother Luke. Uh, I'm currently pulling up the Bible here on my jumbotron. Uh, I was having a little bit of technical difficulties. Uh, okay, go ahead. All right. So now I'm going to go on and uh, said. Uh, Uh, verse 6. Uh, and he overtook them and, and spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore ha saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do anything, should, should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sacks' mouths, we brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondsmen. And he said, Now also let it be according unto your words, he with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Hmm. So this is all being set up for some kind of dramatic uh, uh, ex experience, for them to experience being falsely accused. And uh, I think that uh, the only thing that I can conclude from that is that uh, Joseph wants them to experience what he went through to a certain degree. Now it says, uh, uh, 
Verse 11, then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man his, his ass and returned to the city. So they discovered Joseph's cup in the sack of Benjamin. Now we know that Benjamin is innocent, that, that Joseph had the, can, the, the cup put there so that he could uh, make this all play out the way he, he planned. And, but there they rent their clothes, they rip their clothes. That's like, uh, you know, that's a, a dramatic display of, of, of their feelings. Um, I know that in the time of Jesus, I know that it was common if, if a, a, a Pharisee uh, ripped their clothes, it was a sign of that they're reacting to blasphemy. So in this case, they're ripping their, their clothes. I'm not sure exactly what that means. Let me look at the amplified. Maybe it will amplify this for us a little bit and, and we can understand more of the meaning of that. Okay. Um, it says, then they rent their clothes and after each man had loaded his donkey again, they returned to the city. It doesn't speak any more about renting the clothes, uh, uh, you know, the, the meaning of that. All right, let's go back to the KJV and continue on. All right. Now, uh, verse 14, and Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house for he was, for he was there, for he was yet there and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, what deed is this? that ye have done. What ye not su that such a man as I can certainly divine? <coughs> In other words, how do you think you're going to get away with stealing from me? And verse 16, and Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we, and he also with whom the cup is found. And the cup was found with Benjamin, Joseph's younger brother. In verse 17, and he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And, and as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Wow. This is, uh, I, I'm just wondering how far ahead Joseph has this all planned out. And verse 18, then Judah came near unto him and said, Oh, my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word of, in my Lord's ear and let not thine anger burn against thy servant for thou art even as Pharaoh. In other words, that, you know, he's, he gives him as much respect as Pharaoh himself because he recognized his power and position as the kind of the, the hand of Pharaoh, the, the one in charge. Pharaoh has delegated all authority unto Joseph. Verse 19, my Lord asked his servants saying, have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother, brother is dead. And he alone is left 
of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou sayest unto the servant, Bring him down unto me, that I might set my eyes upon him. And we said unto, and we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I'm confused here. Um, I thought this was cup was found in Benjamin's in Benjamin's uh, sack, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack in verse twelve. Uh, so unless I'm confused myself, Benjamin is there, and it, as we move forward, he's asking about any other brothers. And in verse 20, uh, and in verse uh, 21, he says, And thou says unto thy servant, Bring him down unto me, that I may set my eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou sayest unto thy servants, except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, okay, so I guess they're re recounting what, what happened on their last trip to him. We're kind of recounting the whole series of events. And we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then will we go down? For we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, ye know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me when uh, uh, Jacob, this is Jacob in verse 7, saying, saying that uh, he said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. When he says my wife, he's thinking of the one, the one wife that he really loved and wanted, which was uh, Rachel. Uh, and sh she had two sons. One was Joseph, who the father believed was dead. Uh, and the other was Benjamin, the youngest son, who he's, uh, Jacob is treasuring and because he's the only remaining son of his beloved wife, R Rachel. In verse 28, and, and the one went out from me, and I said, surely he is torn in pieces. So he believed that Joseph was uh, killed by a wild animal, and I saw him not since. Verse 29, and if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall him, ye shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, when I come unto thy servant my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. So, I, it was confusing as I read it, because it sounded like, okay, all these things had already happened. Now they're, they're making a second trip and they have to bring Benjamin on the second trip. And then it looked like, and they, they found the cup in Benjamin's bag. And then I got confused thinking that now he's asking him to uh, bring the youngest son uh, all over again. And, but he wasn't, it was the, just, they're recounting, they're telling the story again. This happens sometimes, like in, in Genesis, we have two accounts of creation. And uh, there's not two creations. It's just the first account is, is general. And then the, the second account is, uh, is retelling it with more details. So this is uh, Reuben repeating the story about what had transpired so that the, Joseph would understand how important Benjamin is to his father Jacob, and and if if they had to leave Benjamin with Joseph 
and to be his servant, they, they think that Jacob couldn't even deal with it. He would probably die from, uh, from uh, grief. So that's what you know, the Benjamin is trying to portray to Joseph here. Verse 31, and it shall come to pass when he seeth that the land is not with us, that we will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. Verse 32, for thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father. Um, this is Benjamin still speaking here. Thy servant, Benjamin, is, I mean, uh, Reuben. Reuben is saying to Joseph, thy servant, which is me, I have become surety for Benjamin. I promised my father that I would not let anything happen to Benjamin. And I told him that if something happens to him, then you can have my life and my, even my children's life because I'm, I'm being held responsible for Benjamin. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father saying, if I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now, therefore, I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad and a bondman to the Lord, to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. So Reuben is pleading with Joseph to, and rather than keeping Benjamin as his servant, let me be your servant. Let me, Reuben, be your servant so that Benjamin can return back to his father. Uh, 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 if that doesn't happen, if he doesn't return, and the father would probably die from grief. And we get to verse 34. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? Let us peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. Okay, so that's the conclusion of chap that chapter. And we got one chapter left that, to bring this all to a, a climax. So I'll go right ahead with that. Let's go to, now we're on Genesis chapter 45. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him and cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So finally, throughout this whole drama, that Joseph has created. On the first trip, he made them afraid because he he put the their payment for the grain back in their bag. So they were afraid that they're going to be charged with uh, stealing. And and uh, and then now now this trip, he puts their the the silver cup in Benjamin's bag. And now they're again afraid. They found out that, well, no, they're going to be, Benjamin is going to be accused of stealing. So this is planned and orchestrated by Joseph. And my opinion is that he's doing this because he wants them to understand and go through this, have empathy. Uh, see, sympathy means that you feel sorry for someone. Empathy means you identify with what they've gone through because you've gone through it yourself. And so by Joseph putting them through this trial and test, they, they will develop empathy. And, under, and just as Joseph was um, uh, innocent and put in the well and then sold in slavery and then innocent but charged with uh, attempted rape by Potiphar's wife and all that time innocent uh, falsely accused he he did this so his brothers could go through that same kind of experience and uh, they would have this empathy with each other I guess but at, now we're at the point in Genesis chapter 45 
Verse one, he finally, Joseph says, clear the room except these men. And Joseph reveals to them who he is. And verse two, he says, and he wept, Joseph wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? Well, I guess he wants the confirmation now that he's devoted to them that he's Joseph. He wants the confirmation to know for sure because they've been talking about the father and how if Benjamin is not returned, he may die from grief. So maybe he wants an absolute certainty to know his father is still alive. And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Yeah, I mean, they're, just, they're probably way beyond shocked. And I mean, totally surprised that obviously so many years had passed, they didn't recognize him physically. And he was dressed as an Egyptian. And, and he, you know, he could speak their language still. And that should have given them some kind of a, make them curious, how did this, he learn to speak our language? Uh, and and they, they just assumed that, you know, Joseph was just some, some little slave somewhere or, or maybe dead. But they never expect him to be equal, almost equal to Pharaoh. So they're just kind of dumbfounded and don't even know what to say. And verse four, and Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. So there can be no doubt. I mean, no one else was even aware except them. So this basically should confirm to them that this is, that this is true. He must be our brother. And no one else even knows that we sold him into slavery. Verse five, now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither for God did send me before you to preserve life. So here we have uh, Joseph saying this was all happened because God had this all in mind, knowing that there would be this famine and that he could put Joseph in this position, be in a position so that he could um, save Jacob and his family from starvation. This was all done, God, you know, being omniscient and sovereign. He, he, he did, by the way, sovereignty uh, God is sovereign, but the way that a Calvinist defines sovereignty is incorrect. A Calvinist believes that the sovereignty of God means that God exercises absolute control over every single thing. In other words, just the fact that I said these words and raised my hand and I'm shaking my hand in this manner, I'm not even doing it. God is controlling every action every word, every thought of every person. That's how a Calvinist see, sees the sovereignty of God. And they don't understand the one, what the word sovereignty really means in this, this case, but it also they don't understand that uh, uh, that's not, God does not exercise that kind of control. Uh, so if you're a Calvinist, if you don't know much about Calvinism, that's the first mistake they make in Calvinism is misunderstanding the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty simply means that God has the ability to control anything he wants to. Uh, I would not ever challenge God's ability to exercise his control of events and people. Uh, but what I challenge in sovereignty is that God is actually controlling every single word I say, everything I do. If that was the case, then every sin I ever committed was 
not actually me sinning. Uh, I would be just an innocent puppet that God is controlling. And God being the puppet master would be the one that's actually guilty of sin. That is the fatal flaw of Calvinism. Calvinism turns God into the sinner and makes man just an innocent puppet. So they, they see that, you know, God's controlling everything, making man sin, and then at the judgment, finding man guilty, even though he didn't even have any free will to, to choose to sin or not. So it would be, I have an exhaustive playlist I did debunking Calvinism. I think the title of this Calvinism debunk. So watch that for a complete refutation of Calvinism. But, but yes, God is sovereign. And in this way, we can see God, God uh, played a part in um, um, orchestrating these, these events so that Joseph would be in this position and he could make these wise decisions so that when the famine came, Egypt had an abundance and they could help Jacob and his family rather than starving. Uh, so Joseph says that God ordained all that. Um, verse six, before he says, in verse five, I'll repeat it. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Now, verse six, for these two years hath the famine been in the land. And yet there are five years in, in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. So the famine will continue for five more years. His prophecy was that the famine would last for seven years, and there are five years remaining. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth. If this wasn't done, then, uh, you know, Jacob and his fam family would die. You know, the scripture tells us that the Savior would come from the family line. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, till we get to Jesus. And if that family line became extinct, then Jesus would not be born through that family line. And that would make the scriptures, make it a false prophecy. So uh, this was all done so that these prophecies could be fulfilled. The, the, this family had to be protected. And verse seven, and God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity. Posterity is a uh, the, the descendants, the, the, your family's descendants in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So this is another reason that people see Joseph as a picture of Jesus. He was completely innocent. He was blameless and yet he suffered. Um, and uh, there was, a, everybody would die from starvation, but Joseph was the one that saved them by, by uh, building up this supply of grain so they can get through the famine. So he would save the people from death, just as Jesus was blameless, but he was, had to suffer and, and he to save, would save us from death. But he saved us from spiritual death, the second death in the lake of fire. Um, let's look at verse 8 so now it was not you that sent me hither but God and he hath made me a Pharaoh a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt haste ye and go up to my father and say unto him thus saith my thy son Joseph God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. <laughs> so now they know, so now they know uh, uh, this, 
this wonderful uh, series of events that they they actually did evil against their brother and God turned it all into good. Verse 10, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children and thy children's children and thy flocks and thy herds and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all that thou hast come to poverty. Uh, so if you don't know how uh, the Israelites uh, ended up in Egypt, this is how it happened. And so they, we're going to see that they do move to Egypt. And Unfortunately, though, after this pharaoh dies, a series of events, it goes very badly for the Israelites with the, the other pharaohs that follow. And uh, we know that they had, uh, I think, 300 years of slavery until we get to Moses. And that'll come up uh, probably next. I think Moses will be the next significant character that we study. But first, we need to complete this on Joseph. Uh, verse 12, and behold, your, your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that ye have seen, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Obviously, it's joyful tears. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. So, I mean, Joseph could have wanted revenge against his brothers. But instead, uh, another picture of Jesus, rather than vengeance and punishment, he, he, he gives them love and forgiveness. And verse 16, and the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house saying, Joseph's brethren are come and it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. So Pharaoh's happy also for Joseph because Pharaoh loves and appreciates Joseph. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, say unto thy brethren, this do ye, lay your beasts and go, get you into unto the land of Canaan and take your father and your household and come unto me and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Also regard not, re not, regard not your stuff for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. <laughs> your stuff. Here we have this King James English and then we have the word stuff in there. Your, regard not your stuff. I would think it would be regard not your possessions. <laughs> Uh, verse 21, and the children of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandments of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the land. To all of them, he gave each man changes of raiment, change of clothing, but to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. So obviously, Joseph loved all his brothers uh, even though they did evil against him uh, even though Reuben uh, was the one that stood up and didn't talk them out of killing Joseph or instead allowed them uh, he, he wasn't there actually they were sold and he was sold into slavery and Reuben came back and discovered he was gone so Reuben is the least guilty 
uh, of all the brothers except for Benjamin. Benjamin had no part in, in any of that. And so uh, as guilty as they were, he forgave them and loved them. But he had a particular love for Benjamin. It wasn't just because he was innocent and didn't participate in this uh, crimes against Joseph, but it was because he was his younger brother. They both had the same mother, Rachel. Just as, just as Jacob had a special kind of love for Joseph and Benjamin, because they were the children of the one whom he truly loved, Rachel. Uh, verse 23, and to his father he sent after this manner, ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt, and ten she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed, and he said unto them, See that ye fall not out of out by the way and they went out up out of egypt and came into the land of canaan unto jacob their father and told him saying joseph is yet alive and he is governor over all the land of egypt and jacob's heart fainted for he believed them not i mean how could he believe that it just it, it's just like you know, he thought he was dead all those years. And not only is he alive, but he's the governor over all of Egypt. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons, which Joseph had sent to, to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. So, as I said, uh, certainly Jacob was just thrilled to find out his son even alive. And then on top of that, he's really the most powerful man in the world uh, because Pharaoh basically put him in charge of everything. He gave him all authority. Let's look at chapter 46. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifice unto the God of his father Isaac. And God made unto, spake unto Israel. Israel is the, the, the man who is formerly named Jacob, the father of the, the 12 children. His name was changed to Israel. So, and God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. So all the time that they're living in Egypt, they're going to grow from this one family into a multitude of people. And that's one of the reasons that the future pharaohs become afraid of them, because they grow so large and powerful. God blesses them. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will sure, also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba. You know, when God spoke to to to, uh, to uh, Jacob, I mean, he's he's saying this. You know, just I just read what God said to him, and it's not some like, yeah, God doesn't speak to me in that way. Does he speak to you in that way? I mean, do you hear like clear sentences? This is I read. Uh, no, uh, uh, he usually impresses upon my spirit. Yeah, brother, glad glad to see see you back there. I I don't know if you got busy or if you heard what I've been saying, but uh, uh, it, it is interesting to, to, that I. Uh, I mean, I, I believe God talks to me through the Holy Spirit, not audibly, not um, in, in sentence, with sentence uh, structures, but just he puts on my heart um, um, the promptings, I would say, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. He prompts me. I think, I, I think my, um, 
it's, it's very general and, and but it doesn't have that kind of specific type of language that I could express. Uh, so this is really a special thing that, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and their conversations with God were just like that. I mean, it was just like we're having a conversation. It was set with real sentences and structure and that kind of communication. It wasn't some vague kind of thing that you and I are experiencing. I wish God would speak to me in sentences and so it would make it that clear. <laughs> Maybe, I'm sure he will in, the, in eternity. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to go on to uh, um, and in verse 6. And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan and came into Egypt Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. And these are the names of the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons Reuben, and, and the sons of Reuben, Hanok and Falu, and Hezron, and Carmi, and the sons of Simeon, that's Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, and Zo Zoar, and Shal, the son of, Can of a Canaanish, Canaanish, Canaanitish woman, <laughs> and the sons of Levi, that's Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, and the sons of Judah, that's Ur, Onan, Shelah, Pharez, Zerah, but Er and Onan died in the land of Canaan, and the sons of Pharez were Hezron and Hamuel, and the sons of Issachar, that's, they were Tola, Fuza, and, jo and Job, and Shimron. I don't know, think this is the same Job, though Job uh, was, was much prior to this. And the sons of Zebulun, that's Sered, Elon, Jalil, these be the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, and Pandaram, and with, with his daughter Dinah. All the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three. And the sons of Gad, that's Ziphion, and Haggai, Shunai, Esbon, Eri, Arodi, and Eli, Erali. And the sons of Asher, that was Jimna, Ishua, and Isui, Isui uh, and uh, Bera, Bariah, and Sarah, their sister. And the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel. And there are the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bare unto Jacob, even sixteen souls. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph and Benjamin, and unto Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. And the sons of Benjamin were Bela and Becher and Ashbel, Gera and Naaman, Ehi and Rosh, Muppin and Huppin and Ard. Boy, Benjamin had a lot of sons. These are the sons of Rachel, which were born to Jacob. All the souls were 14. And the sons of Dan, Humin, Hushim, and the sons of Naphtali, and Jazil and Guni and Zer, Jezer and Shil Shilam. These are the sons of Bilhah, which Laban gave unto Rachel, his daughter, and she bare these unto Jacob. All the souls were seven. And the souls that came with Jacob unto Egypt, which came out of his loins, besides Jacob's sons' wives, all the souls were three score and six. Three score is 60, so that's 66. And the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls, all the souls of the household of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. That's seventy. Uh, and and he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. Okay, I think that uh, you might have got bored if you listened to that, but I think it's significant to, to actually read that and understand that th this Bible apart from 
uh, Psalms and Proverbs and the book of Revelation. Uh, the other rest, all the other books here are, hi it's history. It, it, it's, a, it's a recorded history uh, from Adam and Eve through these um, uh, groups of people uh, that, that finally we get to, to um, Abraham and then through his family, we get the Israelites, the Jewish people. It's their history that's recorded in here. And so that's the one thing that people need to understand that this is a, a history book. History also could be taken as his story, God's story, the, the Jesus' story, the story about how God created man and through this fam a particular family line, God would have his own son, Jesus, become flesh. So it's a history book. It's his story. Brother, want to comment on any of that? Um, yes. Uh, the genealogy names uh, was very interesting, uh, particularly the names uh, Muppin, Huppin, and Ard. Okay. It's like Larry Moe and Curly Joe. Uh, but the um, this is this is a genealogy and it's accurate. Uh, so the, the just more reasons for us to believe and trust the scriptures because it's an accurate history. I mean, the historians and archaeologists they they thought the Bible was wrong about this thing or that thing, and then through. Through the, the centuries, they've done archaeological digs and they've discovered, wait, this this city really did exist. This this history that we find in the Bible is accurate, true history. Uh, but another thing that's significant is that this shows us how many people went into Egypt, and then we can see how they, their population grew immensely, and the Egyptians, the pharaohs, became afraid because the uh, the Israelites grew to such great size so quickly and so much prosperity that they were afraid and intimidated and they ended up making them into slaves. But that comes later when we get into the study of Moses. Let's finish this up here. I'm on verse, uh, and verse 29. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, that's Jacob, to Goshen and presented himself unto him and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. <laughs> Man, what a reunion that would, would be. And Israel said unto Joseph, now let me die since I have seen thy face because thou art yet alive. And I can, I'm putting myself in that, those shoes and, and just that kind of experience is just, uh, uh, it's got to be emotions beyond uh, anything that we I could imagine if, if that uh, my son had thought he was dead and discovered that he was alive and they had this reunion with him. And Joseph said unto his brethren, and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, my brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan are come unto me. And the men are shepherds for their trade hath been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and say, and shall say, what is your occupation? That ye shall say, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth, even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. He's actually instructing his family to lie to Pharaoh and tell him that they raise cattle instead of sheep. What do you think of that, brother? Well, that's very interesting. Uh, he's doing it. The objective is to get them a particular parcel of land. And that is the whole purpose of, uh, uh, 
lying uh, to Pharaoh about their occupation. Uh, we could discuss this privately some more if you like, but uh, that's all I can say about that now. Yeah. Well, I've, I've talked before, uh, I think in studying, well, actually studying this whole family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, the, the, all the brothers, they, they all have a history of lying. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, there, there's like dozens and dozens of accounts of all their lies throughout all this, this family. And now it never really stood out to me before, or maybe it did and I forgot. But now even Joseph, who is blameless, who is, uh, uh, you know, completely innocent and they did all this suffering. In the end here, we see that he ends up telling them to lie. Now, sometimes the question is, are our lies justified? I mean, would you, brother, would you lie if, if you had someone, a, a friend of yours, and people were looking for him and were going to kill him if they found him? And they asked you where he was, and you had him hidden away in your cellar. Uh, would, would you would you feel obligated to say, "Well, I can I cannot tell a lie, so I'm going to have to tell him he's in the cellar," or would you say that, "No, I, I'm I definitely I am justified in lying, so that his life will be saved." Well, uh, what was the relationship of this? Uh person to me again uh, it's just a, a friend or just somebody that's uh, that's innocent and and they're going to kill him or he's not a, it's, it's not like a criminal that is is uh the police are looking for of course you'd want to kill them but this is an innocent person that a mob of people want to kill would you, okay would you to protect them or would you well i'm commanded i'm commanded to love my neighbor yeah. if i have to hide him to save his life, to love him, well, I guess that's what I'll have to do. Yeah, so, but it kind of does surprise me. I doesn't it really surprise you that uh, Joseph, who had this unbelievable relationship with Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh immediately trusted him without any second thoughts. He, he made an immediate decision that this is the man I'm going to put in charge during these seven years because uh, he's the wise man I need. He gave him all this authority and all, and he was blessed with uh, this great power and wealth. And, and, uh, and that in the end, he decides that they need to lie to Pharaoh because I guess the Egyptians have such a hatred for sheep and shepherds. They said, they say it's, it's an abomination. So, he felt it was necessary to tell them they raised cattle instead of sheep. Yes, Brother Luke. And interestingly enough, as uh, far as I'm aware, there is no other documented uh, uh, instance uh, in the book of Genesis where uh, uh, Joseph's behavior violated uh, the Ten Commandments, except for that one uh instance and that also reminds me of uh uh later on in the uh saga when uh israel is ready to depart from egypt god tells them to uh go to their neighbors and uh, borrow from them gold all the gold they could and uh i believe that's the one instance in the bible where uh it's documented that uh, God was uh, telling them to lie. Uh, what are your uh, thoughts on this? Uh, now, what was that example again? That was uh, when, at the end of the story, when uh, Israel is departing from Egypt after the ten plagues, and... Uh, God tells them to, or maybe it was Moses. Okay, we'll have to, uh, uh, I'll have to find the reference for that so we can uh, 
get all the particulars uh, out of it. Okay, I may be wrong on this one. Yeah. All right. Okay, I'm trying to find. Let me see. We just finished. Uh, finish. Finish verse uh, f chapter 46 and 47. I think this will probably be the conclusion. Um, then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, "My father, my brethren, and their flocks and their herds." Um, well, first of all, when he says "and their flocks and their herds," uh, I, I don't think of cattle as ever being referred to as flock. A flock is a sheep. And a herd is cattle, right? So he's it's, it's certainly not, he's not lying to Pharaoh that they have sheep. He says, my father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. <clears throat> and he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, what is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our father. Wow. And they said, moreover unto Pharaoh, for to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks. For the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. <clears throat> now, therefore, we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. I don't know about you, brother, but I'm a little confused because uh, let me go back to that last part again, the end of chapter 46. He says, uh, and the men are shepherds for their trade and verse, this is verse 32, their trade hath been to feed cattle and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have and it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, what is your occupation? That you shall say, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now. Um, and also our fathers, that ye may dwell. So, uh, in verse 34 of this ch chapter, previous chapter, it, he's telling them to say that they raise cattle. And then we go to the next chapter and he's he tells, Joseph tells Pharaoh that they're shepherds, uh, that they have flocks and herds. And then the, when the brothers are asked by Pharaoh their occupation, instead of saying that we raise cattle from our youth, they said, uh, they said more of to Pharaoh. Oh, and he, he answered them, uh, and they said unto Pharaoh, thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. They said moreover unto Pharaoh, for to sojourn in the land we, are we come, for thy servants have no pleasure, no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land. Uh, now therefore we pray, let the ser thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Yeah. Are you are you confused about this as I am, or do you have anything that makes it make it make sense? Because it seems to me Joseph has told them to don't mention sheep because because uh, that sheep are hated, it's an abomination. And then not only does Joseph tell Pharaoh that they're shepherds and they have flocks and herds, but then when they're asked by by the Pharaoh. But their occupation is they they don't say we raise cattle since our youth. They say they say we're shepherds. We have flock, flocks. Any any can you help me with that? Uh, yes, Brother Luke. Uh, absolutely. Um I don't think uh Joseph was uh, instructing them to lie at all. I think what he was doing was he was uh telling them uh to emphasize the fact that they are uh, cattle ranchers uh, as well as uh, shepherds of all sorts of manner of critters. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the whole point in Joseph uh, doing that was for them to obtain the land of Goshen 
for their family to live on. And once that way, uh, they would be assured that uh, land of Goshen to dwell in uh, uh, rather than uh, with the general population of Egypt. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the manner of shepherds, the train has been to feed cattle. Uh, I'll read verse 34 again in the previous chapter. That um, when, he, when Pharaoh asks you what your occupation is, that ye shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth, even until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Well, I, I think that's the only a logical conclusion is the way you, uh, you've expressed it there, is that uh, obviously he's, since a, a, a shepherd is an abomination, I'm assuming that's a person that's exclusively a shepherd, only has sheep. And I know that here in America, there was a time where the cattle ranchers hated the sheep herders because the sheep, when they eat, they, I guess they pull the grass up by the roots. The way that they're able to grasp it, they're pulled up by the roots. The cattle bite it off and, and there's still roots so it grows back. So the cattle ranchers hated the, sh the sheep because the land would become barren after the, she after the sheep went through. Where with cattle, they just bite off part of it and it continues to grow again. Uh, so maybe even back in this time, they didn't want people who were just, just had sheep uh, because it's clear that once once Joseph talks to Pharaoh about his family and what they do, he, he, he doesn't lie to them. He, he says they're shepherds, they have flocks, and they have cattle. So I guess my, the only conclusion I can make is to agree with your, your conclusion, brother, on that. Anything else before we move on? Uh, no, uh, I, I may cut out of here at any time. Uh, my battery may be going dead. Yeah, I'm going to zoom through the rest of this. We're almost done. Um, and the, uh, the land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil days, evil, few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and, and went out from before Pharaoh, and Jason, Joseph placed his father and his brethren, and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread, according to their families. Um, and then... Uh, And then we get to the end of the chapter, and it's and we get to the death of is, uh, Jacob. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17, 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. All right, and that's the, that's the finishes the study on Joseph. Uh, the next study we'll be doing. The next significant character we find in the scriptures, I believe, is Moses. Uh, if I think of somebody of great significance between uh, Joseph and Moses, uh, if you think of one, let me know. Maybe I'll change our plan. But uh, just what comes to mind next is, is Moses. See, now they're in Egypt. They're going to grow into this huge population. They're going to be very prosperous. 
pharaohs will come and die and and finally there comes a pharaoh that is, that hates them and, and and makes them slaves so that's where we're going to go next brother uh we'll end the show but first let me ask you uh do you have enough time to take a minute to tell people how they can get eternal life sure brother luke uh you can receive eternal life uh, simply by asking for it, like uh, Brother Luke has, like we all have. Uh, it's free for the taking. Uh, God says in his word, uh, come, everyone, come and uh, taste the living waters. Uh Jesus Christ is the living water. He's the manna that came down from heaven. And uh, according to scriptures, all we do is uh, look to him for salvation. Uh, and uh, Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures. And then he was buried and rose again the third day, according to scriptures. And... Uh, this is the good news of Jesus Christ by simply believing on him for the forgiveness of sins and for new life. According to the promises in his word, he will give us new life. Uh, if we ask him right now, today, this very moment, if you call upon him, uh, you will obtain that promise uh, and you will know it. Uh, it uh, believe his word and, and uh, he will give you the assurance of your salvation uh, okay go ahead brother Luke yeah. well, well done brother uh, I, I think that, that what I would like to emphasize about what you said is that it, it seems like uh, it, it, it's really easy to, to get this eternal life in heaven um, and that's what strikes me by what you said it seems really easy and I know that the scriptures say that uh, liking getting eternal life is like taking a drink of living water. That was easy. He said, it, it, it's like eating the bread of life. That's easy. It's like e easy as walking through a door. Uh, it's easy as looking. When we get to Moses, you'll see that um, Joseph, Moses put a, uh, a, a snake, a bronze snake on a pole and because the people were dying from venomous snakes and he just put it up on the pole and said, if you just look at this, then you will, you will not die from the snake bites. You'll live. And Jesus compared that as, an, as a comparison to him being lifted up on the cross. And if you just look to Jesus for your salvation, then he'll give it to you. He'll give you heaven. You get to live in heaven forever if you just look to Jesus for it. So these are a lot of examples of how easy it is, as Brother Eric said, you know, um, the, the big mistake that the world makes, and many people who even think they're Christians, um, they don't understand that we get, we get to go to heaven by putting our faith in Jesus to get us there, instead of trying to strive through our own efforts. We just, all we want you to understand, the viewing audience, is that you cannot get to heaven through your own efforts. You have to give up on that and say, no one can do that. And, and, and admit defeat and say, I can't do it. That's why I need a savior. And Jesus said, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. He says he's the only savior. So give up on trying to work your way to heaven through religion. And instead, put your faith in Jesus to get you there. He paid for your sins on the cross. He raised himself from the dead, showing that he can give, he can give from death, he can give you life. He, will, he promised you he will resurrect you unto eternal life too if you put your faith in him. It's really that simple. It's as simple as asking or even simply, even before you ask, simply believing. If you believe what we've told you today is true, at that moment, you get the gift of eternal life and you get the Holy Spirit of God living in you, transforming you, and the scripture says he will never leave you or forsake you. And uh, so once you receive it, 
don't ever have to worry about losing it. It's a promise, and God doesn't break his promises. Brother, I say goodbye to everybody. I thank you for joining me today. Uh, viewers, uh, join me every Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. for the live broadcast. Brother Eric? Bye-bye. Okay. All right. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.